and I ask you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy in chapter 4, and we're going to continue to uh, go through that. Could we uh, get somebody to pray? Gordon, would you mind praying for us as we start the services this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, and thank you for bringing us all together. And we've got a majority of us missing today, and there's so much sickness and all kinds of things going around. I pray that you be, the, be with our missing members and, and lead them and guide them through this day and heal them and help them get back to us and fellowship with us and everything. And I pray that you be with Bob and lead him and guide him today that, that we can get the word from him that we can use to touch those people that we meet throughout this week. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right. We want to, uh, again, if you're, you notice that there's a coffee cup sitting here on the mantel in front of me and it's called Hope Russia and we just want to call your attention to that ministry uh, is to the people of Russia and as you know they're going through a really difficult time right now so you need to lift those folks up in prayer and support those people and uh, our church is wanting to support that mission uh, as well and so we're, we're asking that uh, we all be able to uh, do that We've been talking out of the book of 1 Timothy for some time, and we're kind of doing uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I want you to know, though, that whenever we're teaching a book like this and we're going through it, that there, there is no way that we can go to the depth of all the scriptures and all that they mean, but we want to give you a sense of what they mean and, and what God would have us to know. We need to understand that uh, the scriptures that are given, particularly in 1 Timothy, are given uh, to strengthen us and to help us. And it's really about fellowship. It's really about the connection between the church and the home and how that the church is to be the reflection of the home and so much of what is happening in 1 Timothy then deals with that, rela that relationship that goes both ways there. So we want to talk about the ministry today that God blesses. If we're going to do ministry in our home, if we're going to do ministry in our church, then we need to have the ministry that God is going to use and bless in both. Well, it all starts at the head, doesn't it? If the head is sick, then nothing else is going to go well. If the home has a vacancy in its leadership and the quality of leadership, then it's going to suffer and it's not going to be the home that God would have us model to a lost and dying world. On the same level, if we have a church then, that the leadership is not what it needs to be, is not where it needs to be, then we have a problem similar to what you would have in the home. So we're going to be looking at the leadership in the, in the church, and it begins in verse number 6. It says, I instruct you, the brethren, in these things. You will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. So the first thing that he says is that a good minister of Jesus Christ is to instruct the brethren. He's to help the people of God. He's to make the word of God clear. And so that's one of the things that I've tried desperately to do for the glory of God and for the will of God is to bring the word of God to a place in your heart and in your mind and in your life so that you get a sense for what God is saying and what needs to happen. So when we look and unwrap the passages of scriptures that we look at, we want to give you a sense and a direction for what God is doing and what God wants to do. So it must be remembered 
that the message of Timothy is to bring harmony and God's blessings on his church and subsequently upon the home. That's what God wants to do. He says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that we are to uh, do certain things. And he goes on to talk about this instruction. He says if you instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister. But then he goes on, but reject profane and old wives' tales and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profited a little, but godliness profited for all things, having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. So what he's telling us here in this first part is there are some things that we need to be reminding people about and instructing them in in the church of the living God. We have to do those things. So one of those things that we need to do in the church of the living God is we need to do, and we've been looking at these things in the book of 1 Timothy, starting in verse 1. And if you look at what all we've been looking at in the last four chapters or so, here's what God's message and here's what the instruction has brought about. God's grace and mercy and peace. Again, God wants to bring peace to his people. He wants his grace to be evident. Uh, then he says, uh, we're not to give heed to fables and in the, in the in, uh, endless genealogies. Again, he says that in the earlier part of the book of 1 Timothy, and he readdresses that again in this passage that we read. So within this book, we have two different accounts given where we need to be careful about those things that have no foundation to them. He says, love with a pure heart. This is one of the things that he's taught. A good conscience and sincere faith. Then he says, wage a good warfare. We're involved in a warfare whether we like it or not. That's why Ephesians tells us to put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to you know, withstand the wiles of the devil and all the things that the devil is doing. So we are in a warfare. Well, what do we do about that? Well, Timothy says there's some things we need to do for each other. We need to, we need to use supplications. We need to use prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks, having a thankful spirit. Those are some things that we need to do. Then he talked about the qualifications for an overseer, for deacons. So these are the, some of the instructions that we've looked at thus far in the book of 1 Timothy that you and I need to hold in our mind that we need to know what God is doing that. Now, when God calls, he equips those uh, he has called and he teaches them and he makes in them through their calling a hunger for the word of God. I was talking to a pastor some time ago who was just starting out in the ministry. He had just been called into the ministry. And one of the statements he made to me was, I don't like to read. And I looked at him with a sincere and kind look and said, that will change. I don't believe that if you're the God called man, that God wants you to be, I don't think you can get away from the need to read. You're going to have to find out more than what is resting on the surface with the Word of God if you're going to make sense out of it to the people of God. That's going to require some reading. That's going to require some study. That's going to require some diligence on our part. So there becomes a hungering and a thirsting for the Word of God. Now, I'm not setting myself up as an example, but I don't know what everybody else does. That's none of my business. But as for me, I get up every morning, usually around 5 o'clock a.m., sometimes earlier, and I go to my study, and I start studying the Word of God, and I start working with the Word of God, and I go into my prayer and my worship in those times with God. 
There's another pastor in our area that I visited with, and I was telling him about this, and he has several churches out of one church in our area here. And he said he has the same problem. He can't sleep all night long. And God wakes him up early in the morning with all this stuff on his mind. And he has to go do something with that. Well, if you read the book of Psalms and you look at it carefully, David talks about early in the morning. It seems like God gets our attention early in the morning. Now, there are people who are not good morning people. <laughs> In other words, they don't wake up. I had a guy tell me one time, he says, I have a contract with my heart. I may get up at 6 o'clock, but it doesn't start beating till 10. You know, so we have those kind of things going on in our lives, those kind of things that happen in our lives. But a continual feeding on the truths of Scripture is essential to the health of all believers but this is especially true to one who's going to be an overseer, to one who's going to be a pastor, who's going to lead the church. He has to spend the time knowing God's will through his word. He can't just wing it. He has to know something. Uh, my wife and I talk a lot, but she likes what, for me to do what we would call extemporaneous type preaching, where you just get up, open the Bible, and let her fly. I remember when I was in Bible college that a professor that I had said that he knew a lot of preachers who did that, who just read, who just went to the scriptures and just opened it wherever it fell open. He started preaching from that and it was all extemporaneous. And he said, I've been in some of those services and he said most of the time when that happens, the leader of that particular service has filled his foot with his, his mouth with his foot. <laughs> and so... He, he wasn't too fond of this idea of extemporaneous preaching, but extemporaneous preaching is not extemporaneous preaching in that you just go wherever you want and do whatever you want. You have to read. You have to study. You have to kind of have an idea of what God wants you to say and do, and you've got to get into the Word. And so it's not extemporaneous. You may not be working from a set of notes, but you are working from the Spirit of God, what God has laid on your heart, you have studied and you have read and you have filled your heart so that you can go and speak to the people with the overflow of God's blessings from His Word to them. And that's the kind of preaching that many do and that's the kind of preaching that God honors. But it is not a studyless preaching. It is a diligence to the Word of God. Only by reading the Word, studying it, and meditating on it, and mastering its contents can a pastor fulfill this mandate. I don't know how many times I have woken awake in the morning and I had been struggling with a particular passage of Scripture. Usually it's a Bible verse that I'm writing to send out. And I had already read it and I didn't write anything about it because I just, I couldn't put it all together. And so I would meditate on it all day long and I would think about it. And the next morning when I got up, it became crystal clear. <laughs> and I ran to the office and wrote it down before I forgot it. That's meditating on the scriptures. That's chewing on the scriptures. That's like a, like a preacher once said, like a cow chewing its cud. It's taking the word of God and working it over in your heart and your mind until God gives you the sense of it, until you begin to see what it is that God wants from that particular passage of scripture. So it's all about God. It's about fulfilling God's mandate and not our own. He talks about here the word of faith in this passage of Scripture. What is the word of faith? Well, that's Scripture that takes the priority over everything else. What does the Scripture say in Hebrews? Doesn't it say that the just shall live by what? By faith, right? Well, then if you're going to live by faith, you've got to know what it is, right? So that if you're going to know what faith is, somebody has got to give you the word of faith. 
if you come out of one of these services here and your faith has not been increased in some way, I've been a, I've been a terrible failure. It's the word of faith that we have. Books are good, as we read here. Of writing a book, there's no end. Books are good. Nothing wrong with that. Commentaries are helpful at times. I have a library full of commentaries. I read books. But the focus of a pastor's study has to be and must be the will and the word of God. Bringing clarity to the heart and mind of the people. Pastors are not to stand up in the pulpit, and I've seen this happen so many times, and give a book report. <laughs> having been an English teacher and having taught English classes where they had to, had to do certain things with the book report, I recognized one of them right away. We are not here to give you a book report. We are here to give you the essence of the truth of this word of faith that we hold in our hand. You see, God has to give us his thoughts into our heart and mind because what God wants here, he may not want St. Louis. Amen? What God wants us to know and how he wants us to work may be different in a small church as to a church of thousands. So God does his ministry and Taylor makes it and equips it through the leadership where he has planted a church, established a church for his honor and glory. They're not the same. Every now and then I'll get a, a text message or somebody will call me <laughs> And they're just kidding, of course. But it's amazing how that happens. And they will say, have you been in contact with Dr. David Jeremiah? He said almost the same thing you did. I said, well, no, I haven't talked to him, but good for him. <laughs> Why is that? How does that happen? Because God is developing a message that's universal, that is delivered through his men, and his men sometimes are saying the same thing. Why? Because it's the same book. It's the same message. It's difficult to study the Word of God in this way. It's an intense study. I have word study books all around. I, I do word studies every day to make sure that I am not saying something that is not in accordance with what God has written. I'm very careful about that. We need to be careful about that in our pulpits and in our teaching. What he says here that there are some things that we need to do. Prayer is the best, is best when it's a heart cry from us. And a pastor who refuses to pray over the word of God isn't worth listening to. I know some people are not going to like that. But you need to pray over the scriptures, amen? We need to pray that God will open the word of God up to us so that we can deliver the message to the people of God that God would have us to deliver. And you can't do that most of the time, cold turkey. I study and I preach and I pray over every message. And I was reading a, a book <laughs> lately and it was talking about one of the great preachers of the past. And it said that he prayed every morning before he went into the pulpit. He'd go into his study. He had that opportunity to do that. And he would go into his study and he'd pray. And then he would come out and deliver the message. And so people would say to him, where do you do most of your praying over your message? And what he said was a total surprise to me. But he said, I pray more after the message than I do before it. And I went, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, you've delivered the message, but it needs to penetrate the heart, amen? It needs to change your life. And if they walk out the back door and forget what has been said, you haven't done anything. You've just used up some of their time. 
I find myself praying and examining my messages a whole lot more after I've delivered them and probably proportionately maybe more. I don't know. But I saw the truth of that because that had already been practicing it. It had already become a reality to me that, that I wanted so much for lives to be changed and I wanted the glory of God to be manifested in those lives and I wanted to give the word of God in honesty and sincerity and, and so that the people would have something to work with in their daily life. And if I don't give them something to take outside of the door and if the Holy Spirit doesn't plant it in their heart, I have wasted God's time, my time, and more of and their time. It's important that we get it down. In Acts chapter 2 and verse, in Acts chapter 17, in verse 11, an important passage of scripture, I think. It's, and it's talking about the Bereans. And he says, these were more fair-minded or noble, if you're looking at the King James Version. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. You know what? If I'm teaching you the truth of the Word of God, I hope you're taking some mental notes or some physical notes because you want to make you may want to go back and double check me. I have a whole bunch of messages, <laughs> and believe it or not, for anybody who anybody remember what a cassette tape looks like? I have a whole bunch of messages on cassette tape from way, way back early in my ministry probably 35 years ago. And what sometime when I'm really feeling low and I really need something to chide with my spirit, I'll pick up one of those cassettes and listen to it and shake my head and say, where did that guy come from and why didn't those people throw songbooks at him? They were so patient with me. But I was growing. I was doing the best that I could. But it wasn't always very good. <laughs> At the time, I thought it was. But looking back on it, I'm going like, oh my, 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 my. Did I preach the truth? Yes. But there's some things that you can take away and use, right? And there's some things you can't. We have a couple here that has a little book that they're keeping about sayings of Pastor Bob. Bobby D. <laughs> Some of those little things I come up with that they've never heard before are probably not worth repeating, but they write them down. We have to have an approach to the Word of God with a readiness to discover that truth for ourselves. I can teach you and preach you the truth, but until you discover it for yourself, it's not going to impact your life very well. These people in Berea not only heard the word that, that the Apostle Paul and Barabbas and other, or Barabbas, I mean Barnabas and others preached, okay? They heard the word, but they checked it out. And you should too. Anybody you hear? Then he says here, and he talks about old wives' tales up here in Timothy. He said it's a common saying denoting that it's only fit for uneducated and philosophically weak people who are unsophisticated. In other words, there is little value to it and questionable truth in that saying. I heard somebody say one time, a preacher uh, that was a mentor of mine, said one time, said, yeah, I read that book. There was a lot of stuff in there and there was some sprinkling of truth along the way. But who wants to eat a plate full of garbage just to get one taste of good food? And so sometimes we have to be careful about the things that we hear. Now then, a profitable person or message is one that is helpful. For us to serve Christ. 
it's, surf it's, it's a serviceable message. And the Greek word, odophilimas. And speaking of an accumulative benefit, in other words, to heap up. He says those things that are profitable. Then he goes on to talk about bodily exercise. When bodily exercise is done, we place the body under our control and there is a discipline to exercise. What happens when you exercise the body? You what? You perspire, right? There are times when you're in a regiment of, of exercise and building your body that you don't want to do it. But you force yourself to go out there and do it because why? That's your commitment to build your body to make it stronger, right? So you lift weights and you run and you do those silly things, right? When I was in the Marine Corps, I exercised every day. I lifted weights every day. I ran five miles every day. And somewhere along the way, I decided that I wasn't doing very well building. I was maintaining, but I wasn't building much. So I went out and bought some of those things that you strap on your wrist. And I put five pounds on, the, on each ankle and ran with those on there. Listen, that was hard. But I wanted to be in top physical shape. And the only way to do that was to lift weights, run, and stress out my body. So he says that's a little bit of profit. It's a discipline that we learn. There are benefits to self-discipline. When we use discipline to strengthen weak places in our life, just like we discipline our bodies to get stronger in areas they need to get stronger in. We have to discipline our lives before God so that we become stronger. He's not saying don't go out and exercise. But what he's saying is use that discipline that would you, you would use to strengthen the body, to strengthen your personal walk with God, your spirit. Use that discipline to make yourself stronger in the work of God and the will of God and the purpose of God and the design of God in your life. Spiritual discipline is more valuable than those things that we do for the body. The body is not going to last forever. I don't know if you know that or not. There are a whole lot of things I could do with this body when I was 28, 21, 35, 55, 62, that I can't do now because my body won't cooperate. It won't let me do what I did 40 years ago. But the Spirit of God resting in me, it can be a lot stronger today than it was when I was 32. Why? Because I have disciplined myself to study the Word of God, to know the Word of God, to teach the Word of God, to live the Word of God. It's a practical event that happens every day of my life. The Bereans were more noble because that's what they did. Spiritual discipline is valuable. It takes a disciplined spirit to follow after God by studying His Word and telling the body to do those things that it is hard to do sometimes or most of the time. In other words, to drag ourselves away from something that we're enjoying to do something that we really don't want to do. There are a lot of people who like to watch baseball. I'm one of those. And there are times that I have to turn off the TV set and go to my study and do those things that need to be done more than the things that I want to do. <laughs> do you understand that? 
You have to do that. If you don't do that, you will not have the spiritual stamina that you will need at some point in your life. You will be spiritually deficient and untrained and you will collapse under the weight that comes before you. You have to build the spirit man through the word of God. He says in verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. When I first read that, I'm going like, what? What does that mean? That doesn't seem to fit anywhere. It's just, just like somewhere Paul says in parentheses, hey, this is something you ought to hear. Something you ought to pay attention to. Next time, we're going to tell you what that means. Because it is not readily evident. That's one of those things I had to go to bed on. And, it, and actually a couple of days. And then all of a sudden God turned on the light and said, Don't you see that? And I said, Now I see it. It's not what you think it is. Thank God for his word. We need to be committed to it. God will bless your life if you commit yourself to the word of God. God will bless your home if you will commit yourself to the Word of God. God will bless your life and give you spiritual strength if you'll study the Word of God. If you ignore it, you will be weak. And you will not be able to withstand the trials that come your way, those spiritual trials that are sure to come. Churches who are not built on the Word of God fold when the pressure comes. Will you be faithful or will you not be faithful? Will you follow God or will you not follow God? Will you go to church when you're supposed to go to church or will you stay home? What are you going to do? It all depends on the spiritual climate that you have. Is there a hunger and thirst for the word of God? I don't believe there's anybody who is a child of God who doesn't have a certain amount of hunger and thirst for the word of God. I close with this. What's your favorite food? And when that food is set before you, how much of that do you eat before you're done? I can tell you right now what it is. Too much. <laughs> right? You come out of there feeling like you ate the whole thing and you probably did. Why? Because you had a thirst and a hunger for it. God, may we have a thirst and a hunger in our heart for the word of God. God, may we redevelop our lives so that we have a life that is profitable and a profitable life that ministers to those who are in need. God, help us not only as overseers to follow after you hard in the scriptures, but God, may we teach and preach and admonish and encourage those who hear the message to study, to know your word, to develop a thirst and a hunger for the word of God. You develop a thirst and a hunger, I know, Lord, by just going after that until it becomes a necessity in your life. God, help us to do that with your word. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.